it's a funny question because horror, being a horror fan, a uh, consumer of horror films is completely different than how I got into horror filmmaking. And um, so I've always wanted to be a filmmaker since I was a little kid, but I've always watched horror movies as a, since I was a little kid too. But I was, I loved scaring myself in the eighties um, with uh, the exorcist and uh, the, the, the uh, Friday the 13th scene. Nightmare on Elm Street movies I couldn't get through because they're just too scared, uh, scary for me. Um, but I just I love to go scare. I think scary uh, scary movies are so much fun. I just love that feeling, that adrenaline you get um, just watching a good horror film. But then when I realized uh, when I really wanted to sit down and like really make my first feature film, uh, it just everything just all kind of made sense to it. It should really be in the horror genre. It's a, it's a genre I know very well. I think it's a genre that is very um, it, it has a built in audience that you don't need uh a-list actors to be in um it's it's i think horror fans like are very accepting of low budget horror films um as long as it scares them you, you, people just want a good scare and they don't care if you spend a million dollars on it or a thousand dollars on it was it something you know because obviously it's a trilogy now it's a series you know with a prequel film coming out when you wrote that first draft, did you always kind of think that it was going to be a trilogy or was that something that with each subsequent draft, you were like, there's more story here. There's a lot more that we can tell. Yeah, the the first few drafts of the film were narrative, not found footage. So um, and they but they weren't good. Um, I didn't like the first few drafts. I lost. I had the basic concept. I wanted to make I wanted to make a film about a haunted house gone wrong. It's just, it's just, a, I think it's a concept because if you're in a haunted house and something goes wrong, how do you know if it's wrong? It's not part of the show. So I started with that concept, but it was told more narratively. Um, and the group of people that they, they came out of New York, they did take over an abandoned place. And every subsequent draft, the story got deeper and deeper. Uh, I never intended to make uh this into like a trilogy but um i knew that it could it could possibly do that and i was like and i would always joke like well i'll i'll tie up that loophole when we do the the second film which i always said that as a joke never really thinking i would ever do it um and then uh and then i had the opportunity to finish up the story tell more of the story that was originally there um uh, you know through the found footage lens staying in that world of found footage but um it's just all the subsequent drafts you know, I, I lost a little bit more of the story and just had to really focus on found footage. You can only tell the story of what's there. I tried to fill, fill in a lot of other stuff through doing it like a documentary, which allows you to fill in some gaps, but not not other gaps. And I left things purposely vague and I wanted um, things to just be hinted at without really being answered. Initially, it started off as a narrative and then eventually moved to found footage. When it came to the script, how did the script kind of change dialogue wise once you got to found footage? Because was it a mix of you let the actors maybe improvise a little bit more um, or was it a lot of, you know, just try working with them and trying to make the written dialogue a little more like natural? When you switch to found footage, you can do more improv, obviously, because you'll have one camera set up. So it gets, it's way too, you, you really can't venture into too much improv when you're shooting something traditional narrative style, because you have all the camera setups, the continuity's got to stay the same. Um, so when we switched to found footage, obviously that, that allowed more improv within scenes. So um, everything's scripted. Uh, every scene is scripted out it, it, exactly the way it's, it was supposed to be. So what I did is um, we would shoot the scenes a few takes as scripted, exactly as it was. And it never like word for word scripted. It's generally like like if they have like a paragraph of dialogue, they're getting out the gist of what that paragraph is. If they change a few words, you know, I and I always tell the even on this newest film, I just tell the actors never worry about word for word line of dialogue. You can you can venture off here or there, you know, go for it on this like what I would call a wild card take. And we would sometimes, I would sit in the edit room and I would be able to get a good blend of both takes, the scripted takes and the improv takes and kind of meld them to get, mold them together to make the scene. You know, on top of like budget stuff, you know, found footage also creates its issues. What were sort of some trials you had to face when making these movies, um, whether that be like having to change maybe some stuff in the script because the budget didn't permit, or maybe, you know, like some scenes were a little more difficult to shoot given like what the, you could do with the found footage uh, concept. In found footage is um, a, a curse and a blessing. It's a, it, it's great because you're, you only have one camera set up. So we really, 
um, can shoot these films pretty quick. I, uh, average on all of them have been around 12 to 14 days. I think the original was like 12, 13 days, something like that. You don't get coverage and I love coverage. I'm a, yeah, I went to film school. I love just mapping out a scene and mapping out different ways to cover a scare. And you don't get that. And, and you just have to pick out one way to shoot the, each scene and that's it. That's all you get. And I, um, I, I, I hate that, but it's, it works out because it makes some scenes, scenes very scary. But also it's just, it's just the challenge of like, how are we going to get everything out? But then also you have to justify in found footage, why is the camera on? You never have to justify that in third person, just traditional narrative, because it's just, you know, fly on the wall. Uh, there's some scenes that they were tough to film. I think one of the toughest scenes to film in uh, the original was the uh, Sarah death scene. Um, not it, it's just not because of logistics uh, logistics the toughest scene in the film is obviously the chaos with all the extras and everyone running out of the hotel that was logistically the toughest one to film but it um but just in terms of it being in the found footage world the uh, killing sarah never worked the way it was scripted and, and she was supposed to die on camera paul was supposed to actually like stab her to death and mm -hmm. and it was actually um danny uh and gore who play um alex and uh paul who were talking about the scene and they they and they they brainstormed on the way and they came to me they're like hey we're thinking what if like since paul has got the camera the whole time why don't why doesn't he just use the camera as the weapon and he just bashed her in the face with it and i was like yeah great idea let's shoot it that way and we found time in the script to reshoot that scene and that's another thing about found footage is if you need to find time somewhere to reshoot something you can find it in found footage you know because it's it's like the it's we can speed up shooting another scene um, because it's again that one camera angle just helps so much. As someone who is from PA, I have of course actually seen um, the building that was used yeah. as the Abaddon Hotel, and the way I was going took me through Lee Heighton, and literally I almost I slammed on the brakes so goddamn hard I had to pull over to the side of the road because. Hold on. I am literally outside the Abaddon Hotel. Literally drove right past it. I, I'm i speechless and terrified. Um, so the, as I was writing this, the story just came from my setting. I'm looking out across this river from, from uh, over the Hudson River in, into this area over there. And so I said, these, these characters are gonna be New York based haunt players that are going to leave the city for whatever reason, I'll come to that. Um, you know, it's we always say upstate. It's not really upstate, obviously. It's just across the river, but uh, it's just a beautiful country out there. And then I came upon this um, abandoned house uh, that looked so creepy and so awesome. And it was just like kind of tucked back in the road a little bit. But um, I just coming upon that abandoned house, a lot of my stories are inspired from abandoned locations and abandoned photography and, and, and Hell House. Finding that house really just, you know, lit the fuse it just sparked a lot more imagination in the story and, and got the writing going quicker and, and, and just I just said well I found this house in Rockland this is where the story is going to take place um, and then the fictional town of Abaddon within um, Rockland County. And I realized this is like a logistical nightmare um, to try to shoot in an actual abandoned place so then I find I started looking for haunted houses that actually have an, an abandoned look um and so i started emailing all these places and there's a lot you know a lot of band, a lot of cool haunted attractions take over places that have that really cool look it, it you know looks like it's uh, it hasn't been touched in years but this one woman angie moyer who runs the uh waldo for state of fear and lee Heighton, she was enthusiastically um was like yeah come check out my haunt i'll give you a tour i sent her the script so when i met her um she had a good idea of like what i was looking for and she would show me she's like and she's like, the scenes can maybe you could do this scene here, this scene there, and, and, and it fit perfectly. And then meeting Angie was probably the best thing that happened for me because she was such a great um, asset for um, Hell House because she found us so much, um, she found us local crew, some local actors, um, all the extras we need for that scene. Um, and she's, she's a haunt, that's what she does. She does Alex's job for a living. So of the three Hell House movies, um, obviously, speaking again of my roommate, Emma, she does not scare easily. Um, but the Hell House movies did freak her out, and there were a couple jump scares that really got her yeah. out of her seat. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the scares that you've had in the movies, out of the three that you've done so far, which scare is your favorite? I, from what I hear from people that watch the film and reach out to me, their favorite scare, the, the two I hear the most are 
the little girl in the bedroom and in Paul's bedroom when he turns on the light. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that worked out really well. Um, and then the one with the clowns at the top of the basement steps and Paul turns the camera away and turns it back to the clown and the, and the clown's facing him. But um, for me, I, my favorite, I, I have to think is the one where Paul wakes up in the middle of the night, hears a noise and looks out of the bedroom, looks down the stairs and the clown is standing at the bottom of the stairs. Mm -hmm. It's probably the first scare I've ever thought of in my life in, in terms of script, in script form. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I'm happy with the way it came out. I think it was creepy and and just the way they they approach it coming down the stairs. Um, it worked out. But I, I but I think not not from a technical standpoint or anything else. More just uh, you know just from the heart. This like I just love that scare because it survived from the first uh, one on. And uh, the the strobe light scene in the first one, it was probably I think it was like the second scare where it, that never changed from first draft of the script to the final draft of the script. That was exactly the way it was scripted to be. At the end of it, uh, Paul, um, he throws up. And I heard a rumor uh, from a podcast I listened to yeah. that the actor who plays Paul, um, it wasn't in the script. He just threw up after uh, that after that scene. Is that true? Kind of, was it because of the strobe lights? Was it just in no, the, was uh, it like, what What kind of led to that? 1000% true. It's hilarious that happened. And obviously when it happened, um, but uh, it happened uh, because he and the other uh, cast members, um, the Hell House crew, they did a lot of uh, partying while we were mm -hmm. out there. And there's a bar right next to our hotel. And mm -hmm. that's a spells trouble because you don't, you don't for the night, you know, you got like, we're, most people will just go to sleep, um, but they they went and but they, they were they were very close. They they bonded over the shoot and they're good, they're still to this day good friends. So, and they went out and parties a lot of it, and they and they stayed out very late that night. And I remember I think that was the night where he uh, Gore Abrams who plays Paul at the bar won the dance contest um, because um, there was a dance contest and he just drunkenly got like entered it and you know. The, the drunk guy in the dance floor, the DJ was like, all right, he's the winner. And I'm like, sorry, sorry, Corey, you gotta jump over this bar for a bunch of takes. And then finally in that take, I forget which, how many he had done so far. That was the one that was just like, I can't do this anymore. And he just threw up uh, just from being hungover. <laughs> So I'm glad to hear uh, that. I was, I'm glad to hear that rumor uh, finally confirmed. Yeah, and it shocked Tony too, um, Jared Hacker, because uh, you know he comes and meets Gore mm -hmm. as he comes out, and like, and I don't think you know you could tell Hacker was like genuinely like, whoa, what the hell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Hell House LLC Origins. Um, just kind of what can you tell us about this prequel film? You know, like. Is it all, is it found footage? You know, how much is it going to connect to the first three? Um, and just kind of what what can you tell us about this new movie? So a few things, um, it is found footage, yes. Um, it is not actually a prequel. Okay. Uh, it is set modern day while, and while exploring and answering a lot of the mysteries of how some of the things that we knew in the early franchise came to be. When um, I, I was, I decided to burn the Avondown Hotel to the ground at the end of three, because um, I thought it was, that was a good conclusion, but I was also like, great, because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck out of ideas for, for what to do in that hotel anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, and uh, so when I, just, when I started writing this film, I was just excited about the ideas to having a new it's like an original concept, original story in a whole new original location. So would you say that there is zero chance that your friend behind you uh, could possibly reappear sometime in the future? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't know what we're, what I can and cannot say. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be friends from the past that we'll see um, in this film and uh, and learn more about their past. Um, and uh, that's, that's really all I could say, but I think we're gonna get a lot more into things, the, the things that people liked about one and is kind of give a lot more depth to them, um, but all in an original story, not really a sequel. I think um, it got confused um, online about it being a prequel. 
Um, I, I think that was uh, because I, I, the distributor said a few things like it, it explores prequel ideas, and I think that means mm -hmm. a lot of people said like, "Oh, it's a prequel," and, and yeah, um, I wasn't going to go around correcting everyone saying, "No, no, no, it's a sequel. It's 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 a, not a prequel. It's it's but it's not even a sequel though." And that's the thing we want to move away from just saying this is Hell House Four because it's not. It's really it's just a whole new original film, and that's what I've all been so excited to do with within this um, world of Hell House is make something completely original in the world and not be tied to the Abaddon and uh, that's what this is. What is what's that go to horror film that like you can always kind of recommend to people uh, whether you know like fans of the genre you know beginners people who yeah. just looking for a good scary movie kind of what's the one that you recommend? If you like Hell House you're gonna love the movie Lake Mungo. Steven, you have no idea how happy uh, that makes me. It's nothing about that is over the top. It's just perfect, and it's so realistic in a, in a documentary sense. Um, I, uh, I, mean, I tip my hat to the filmmakers of, of that movie so much because I think seeing that film um, really uh, inspired me to want to tell the story in doc format. And knowing that a documentary, uh, a foul documentary in the horror genre could be scary because Lake Mungo, they nailed it. Um definitely agree with most it is still probably one of the scariest films ever made though lake mungo and hell house are kind of up there as well for i know a lot of people uh, including myself they're always good for uh to creep you out right in time for halloween um but i want to thank you again so much uh for sitting down with me answering my questions and getting to be a part of this uh, really great cause um and yeah i just uh, want to thank you so much no, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, great cause. And, and just when you reached out, I was happy to be a part of it. So thanks so much. Hurry! Hurry!